Good evening, everyone. My name's John Davis. I'm director of the Myelin Group. This is our 102nd meeting. Um, woo, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, before we begin, as always, a huge thank you to our friends at Hewlett Packard. Now, now tonight is a particular huge thank you because I've just this second been given the green light to announce that she's not actually here, is she? She's not in the room, so you can all sort of like cheer when she arrives. Um, our great friend, Sir Michael Barber, um, this will be his third Myelin Group tonight. He did one in 2005, one in 2007. Now, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, Sir Michael uh, was uh, head of the Prime Minister's Delivery Unit, created it, 2001 to 2005. What you might not know is that Michael kept a diary while he was there. And about two years ago, he contacted me and said that he wanted us to very delicately, because a, a diary is a delicate and personal thing, if we would delicately look after it. He thought that it would be a quite remarkable PhD, and we certainly hope so. And so tonight I can announce that Hewlett Packard will fund Michelle Clement to do her PhD <laughs> on Michael Barber's diary. It took a long while, but we got there, and we got there, and so we're all looking forward to that hugely, and I'm sure that will be a mile in group in its own right. So a very big thank you to HP. Um, this is one of my longer uh, 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 intros, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our very great friend, Sir Michael Barber, who is going to talk about the emerging science of delivery. Michael. Um, well, th thank you, John, for that kind introduction, and, and thank you. Uh, it sounds like I'm three percent of all your meetings, uh, nearly, um, and and it's a pleasure to be here. One of the reasons I like, really like coming here, is you get this uh, mix of uh, people who are very experienced and have seen a lot of government in action and know a lot and uh, are challenging and thoughtful and ask really great questions, and then um, lots of students who are committed, interested, excited about government in the future and this, this sort of mix of people who are really interested in the broad context and making government more effective, learning the history, what it, whatever it might be, it makes it a really very, very vibrant place to come. Um, so I'm always very happy to be here. Um, and I suppose before I go any further, I should just say good luck, Michelle, um, with that. Um, <laughs> um, reading my writing will be the first challenge and then uh, after that it'll get easier. Um, but um, I, th I, I always thought... Um, having been a professor before I was in government, that somehow if anything interesting happened, it would be good to make it um, an interesting PhD. So and I think it will be a very interesting PhD. Um, and as, as John says, the diary is a very sort of personal and sensitive thing and we will, we will be uh, careful about that. And we, we're meeting soon to just to, to go through how that will all work. But and it, it'll be how, long, how long is it going to take you to finish, Michelle? Three years. Three years. <laughs> well, um, I've had, I had some... <laughs> I had some PhD students who are still going after 10 or 15 years, but um, I'm hoping three years will be, that will be good. Um, what I want to do, so, so and then, so, uh, as John said, I, I um, um, set up and established with uh, uh, colleagues in number 10 and Tony Blair, the, the delivery unit. Um, and since I left, um, some of you will have seen a, a couple of things I've written. One, the instruction to deliver, which was a story of my time in the Blair administration, uh, telling the story of the delivery unit, which is, um, Got generated quite, quite a lot of interest here and, and, and around the world. And I think partly what people say to me is it captures the flavor of the challenge of getting things done um, with some narrative. Um, and then the second thing I wrote about, based on that experience, but broadening it, um, uh, which is the most boring book I've ever written, and I hope it uh, will remain that way because I want all the future ones to be more interesting, is called Deliverology 101. And I wrote it for Corwin Press in the US. And it's um, it's like the, it's not the story, it's the manual. It's like the thing you get when you, uh, when you buy a car. There's a, there's a sort of manual that you hardly ever look at, but at certain moments it's absolutely crucial, um, like knowing the tire pressure or whatever it is. Um, so it's the, it's the manual, and it, Delirology 101 was written specifically for um, the US education market, although most of it is generalizable. And it was, um, set up, it, it was the textbook for the 
US not-for-profit that I set up in Washington called the Education Delivery Institute, which is um, doing, I, I've, I've, apart from being its founder, I have very little to do with it now, but I follow it obviously with interest. It's working with about 15 or 20 US states on implementing education reforms effectively, both at the public higher education level and at the um, school sector. And it's, I think it's really helped um, the current administration do uh, quite effective, uh, in collaboration with the states, do quite effective education reform, at least in some places. And Deliverology 101 is the textbook, and basically that says there are five things you have to think about, uh, for five areas, and then there are 15 modules, and if you follow the modules through thoroughly, whatever you set out to deliver, maybe with some refinement, will in the end deliver its result. Um, and that the reason I wanted to do this at this time is the next book I'm going to write is going to be called The Emerging Science of Delivery. At least that's the working title. It'll probably be published about this time next year, and maybe, maybe I'll do my fourth session uh, with you then, John. But, um, and I want to write a book that takes the content of Deliverology 101 but makes it riveting as opposed to dull. Um, <laughs> and um, of course, the, the, there's two sources of this, and it was, it was realizing the second source that made, it, um, made me realize I could at least attempt this book. Because one source is the people around the world, and I'll come to that in a minute, who have taken what we did in the Blair delivery unit um, and taken it to Malaysia and Pakistan and Brazil and lots of other places, which we'll come to in a minute. So one source is when, when people got that concept of a delivery unit and implementation and a focus on that, how did they use it? Um, and there are lots of examples of that now. But the other source, when you break down delivery into its constituent elements, whether it's the 15 modules in Deliverology 101 or the 10 chapters that there will be in this new book, there are the, the whole of history is a source for parts of it. So planning, as opposed to writing a plan, planning is a really key part of delivery. And people have been doing that for ages. So you can, you can as I've just been trying to write about, talk about how Eisenhower spent time planning the invasion of Normandy. And it's, it's a kind of brilliant example of planning. And what he says is, um, the planning is really important, but as soon as you engage in battle, it becomes irrelevant. But you've got to do it. The plan isn't important, but the planning is really important. Um, Mike Tyson uh, put it rather more crisply. He said, "Everybody has a plan till they get punched in the mouth." <laughs> um, but you can. So, so when, once you start drawing on history as a source for d deliverology, um, suddenly you can start bringing characters into it. So the idea of the next book is to take the content of Deliverology 101, I use global examples, and then use history uh, to illustrate parts of it. So that's the theory. But what I wanted to do here was just test some of the, the ideas. Many of, so, some of them, those of you who followed the delivery unit and, and, and um, the, the, the various international replications of it will know some of this. But then there's also some new bits of thinking that I've done that I want to test with you. So um, this is not a finished lecture. It's a kind of work in progress that I want to just test out on you and feel free, um, as I know you do anyway in the Myland group, to say whatever you want, think whatever you want, challenge whatever you want and argue. So that's the, that's the context uh, for, for this. The second bit of context that is actually also very important is that the world is very different now from the days of the Blair administration. Um, as it happens, I saw um, Tony Blair within the last few days and we, we were talking about this work wi which f he, he says in terms of the domestic policy was the biggest and most important thing that he did that to the, the sort of realization and, and that, that when he meets leaders around the world this is what they mostly ask about but um, the world has changed because we we did delivery in a period of rising uh, economic growth uh, rising public expenditure uh, so we set targets for some very ambitious targets for improvement but we had money to spend so Blair could go around saying investment for reform do you remember the mantra. Um, that's not like that anymore. So to me that makes deliverology all the more important because you need to make every tax pound work harder or tax dollar or whatever your currency is uh, to deliver the outcomes you want for the citizens. On the other hand, uh, it needs to change because you're doing, uh, you're trying to um, improve the outcomes in a time when public expenditure is constrained uh, and indeed uh, in Britain and other places actually being uh, reduced, certainly as a proportion of GDP over a period of time. So the, 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 I just wanted to give you the background on what the lecture was about, and then also 
to bear in mind this change in global context. Other things have changed as well. Like it was revolutionary to go around Whitehall asking for big data sets now. You, the whole world is being driven by big data now. I read this wonderful, um, well not wonderful, but slightly disturbing story about one of the big supermarket chains in the US where they realized, um, uh, this is apparently is common knowledge in the retail world, that if you, uh, if, 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 um, if you can get uh, a woman uh, and her husband, but if, if she's a single mother, um, so be it, start shopping in your shop when, when, the baby is, when a baby is very small, they'll be very loyal customers for a long time. So they asked, it's called Target, this store. It's a, I think it's the second biggest after Walmart. So they said to their statisticians, can you, is there any way you can predict from all the loyalty cards which women who are shopping here will have a baby within the next few months? Because then we can start marketing before they have the baby. So uh, he works it out. And you know, so obviously there's certain things that, 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 that women buy in. Uh, when they're sort of five or six months pregnant, I don't know what they are, but anyway, he, he worked it all out. <laughs> um, I've forgotten, as it were. Um, my children, my youngest daughter is 29. Um, so, um, but then, then they, so then they started sending out the marketing, and they get a complaint from a father of a 15-year-old girl who's been sent this stuff, and so this is absolutely, this is outrageous. How can you send this stuff to my daughter when she's not pregnant? And then it turned out she was pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> so they knew better than he did. And then, then obviously you can get into a whole lot of ethical complexity. They stopped doing it, you'll be pleased to know. <laughs> I'm just telling you, with that kind of data, um, which is coming to every government near you, uh, there's lots of things you can do that will make public services delivery much, much more efficient than we could possibly have done in the delivery unit but there will be the ethical issues associated with it. And you can see that all the time with the whole debate around WikiLeaks or whatever it is. So there, there are some new issues that are in the gl changing global context, globalization and technology will change delivery in the same way that they change everything else. So that's background. Right, here we go. So you remember the famous uh, Russian Prime Minister, Viktor Chernomyrdin in the 90s, wonderful man. The Russians still love him. They don't generally love politicians, they love him because he was funny. He once said, we keep inventing new institutions in Russia, but they all turn out to be the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. <laughs> On another occasion, he said, things have never, like, never been like this before, and now it's exactly the same again. <laughs> but the one I like is, he said, we tried to do better, but everything turned out as usual. <laughs> and that must be the epitaph of lots of politicians over a period of time. We tried to do better, but everything turned out as usual. Um, and um, I've got a slide with that one. There it is. Um, I can't do it in Russian. Uh, but uh, so, so um, the point about deliverology is we don't want politicians to be elected on a wave of enthusiasm, think they're going to change the world, and then leave office thinking we tried to do better, but it turned out as usual. Because actually, democracy does, <coughs> at least in part, depend on uh, listening to what people say they're going to do, uh, electing them, if, we, if, if as an electorate we choose to elect them, uh, to do it, and then when they get there, actually doing it. Um, and if some of that process doesn't really work, you end up with um, risks of cynicism. So there's, a, there's an argument to be said that getting delivery right, while at one level technocratic, is actually a fundamental thing about trust in government uh, uh, and indeed uh, uh, in, in democracy. So, we, so we, we, we in the Blair administration I, I guess we innovated and, and developed the delivery unit, and the idea was to have something at the center of government that really focused on the implementation and didn't get constantly distracted into the latest policy debate, the latest policy crisis. I remember very, very vividly September the 11th, 2001, passing Blair's office, and you could see that he'd just come back from a TUC conference where he didn't deliver the speech, as you probably remember. And there's a, there's a mill of people there. You know, I can recognize the, the transport people and the communications people. And then there's the people I don't know. They're probably spies. Or I don't know what they are. But they're, and there's the defense people. But anyway, there's a maelstrom of people around the prime minister, rightly, because this is a big, big crisis. I'm passing. I think my instinct is to go in and say, what can I do to help? But I realize that would be com completely absurd, partly because I've got nothing to offer in that debate. It, of course, it would be interesting, but I've got nothing to offer. But then I realized that was completely misunderstanding. My role was to make sure that everything else kept going while this crisis occurred. That was the whole point of the delivery. Why else would you have it? So I actually walked on and didn't go into the room. 
never had anything to do with that and really focused. M my job was to keep the show on the road, quite literally. Um, and so when we, when we started, well after I left and, and then when Tony left and we started um, being in various parts of the world talking about it, we found that politicians and governments were really interested in this stuff. And over, over a period of time, and this is just a, a, a some examples, there are, there are lots of um, political systems that have copied this. So uh, I, I did a lot of work in Malaysia where the Prime Minister um, Najib Razak set up a delivery unit. Mal the Malay word for, for um, driver is Pemandu. So the delivery unit is called Pemandu. It's run by a brilliant guy called Idris Jala, who's um, they told me when he was appointed that his grandfather was a headhunter, and I said, which firm? And they said, no, no, a headhunter in <laughs> Borneo. <laughs> so this guy, this guy had gone from a grandfather who had been a headhunter in Borneo, then he ran Malaysia Airlines, and now he's basically running Malaysia. Um, and he's brilliant. So they've done it really well, and in some ways better than we did it. Uh, Australia, various states have, have experimented with it, including at different times the federal government. In Pakistan, in the state, in the province of Punjab, the, the province of Punjab, I go every two months to do a big education reform, which I've been working on for three years. The chief minister of Punjab is a brilliant deliverologist. Deliver 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 we have uh, got some approaching two million extra children into school in the last two years. Uh, the stock takes always happen. It's absolutely a routine, and it's building the routines into government has been really crucial. I won't go right round this. Uh, very uh, Ontario, when Dalton McGuinty was prim uh, Premier, did it. Various US states I've already mentioned. Minas Gerais, the, uh, the province in Brazil, where Belo Horizonte is the capital, uh, is doing it really well. The current president of Chile experimented with, I'm not sure he got quite got it right. Sierra Leone, the Minister of Health, has got it absolutely cracked. And then there are various other countries. But these are just some examples. So the basic idea that you build some routines, build a focus on implementation, set some goals and track progress, which actually is not that big, bold an idea, it's just very, very uh, thorough, has been adopted. And whenever you do it properly, it works. It's a really, th and that's why I talk about an emerging science of delivery. There are some things that you can just do and they will work. Um, so I want to strip that down and say, well, what is the emerging science of delivery? Well, wh well one thing is there's quite a few bits to, to getting this right well-developed policy, I mean, if, you, if you've got a really bad policy, however well you try and implement it, it's going to cause trouble. Many of the things that you want to do require political will. If you haven't got the political will, if you haven't got a leader who will prioritise, if you haven't got somebody who will take some tough decisions or see things through, it's not going to work. And then you need the effective approach to delivery. So delivery, the de a delivery approach doesn't solve all these problems. You, you can't, it's no, there's no substitute for good political leadership in the end. It does do this, though, and it helps with this, but it doesn't solve all those problems. But that's, I'm just giving you that as a, a, a kind of piece of background context. And then, so I'm now going to go, I'm not going to deal with the political will question at this time, but we, we can debate it. I mean, obviously, it's really fundamental, um, and, we, and we can debate it. I am going to talk about the policy bit and the delivery bit, mainly the delivery bit. Um, I was thinking about... Um, I was thinking about how you get things done. Uh, there, there are some policies where you just have to do, decide, OK, so we, we want to ban smoking in enclosed spaces. You can just pass a law, and if there's sufficient popular support for it, um, it'll just happen. It doesn't need a big delivery approach. There's a communication element, but it's not, it's not massive. But if you're trying to change a big service like the National Health Service or the Indian Railway System or the Punjab Education System um, or public transport in... Uh, Kuala Lumpur, it does take, you've got to have a, a, an approach to delivering it. But before you get the approach to delivering it, you've also got to know broadly what kind of polit uh, um, policy strategy you are engaged in. So I gave some thought to this, and some of you, the sad ones among you, will remember that I wrote something called Three Paradigms of uh, Reform a few years ago, and I talked about um, command and control, uh, quasi-markets, and devolution and transparency. But then I thought, well, hang on a minute. Those are the three that we worked on in the Blair administration, but at either extreme, there are two others that I just want to bring in. And so now it's five paradigms. And I just want to spend a bit of time on this. The first one is, there's a great, there's a great guy, I don't know if you know him, John, um, called Gwyn Bevan at L London School of Economics. He writes about this stuff. Um, really, really good academic. And he, he's spent a lot of the last 15 years 
studying what he calls the natural experiment of the United Kingdom after devolution. So after Wales and um, Scotland uh, and Northern Ireland slightly later got their own political systems, they began that what had basically been similar, uh, certainly in, in the health service area, but, and to some extent in education, had basically had similar policies, began to diverge really significantly, and he tracked the impact of that. And basically, a lot of his comparisons, he's Welsh, but he works in England, a lot of his comparisons are between Wales and England on health and education. And, and those of you that followed this will, will know that the, the Welsh Assembly government from 1998 till about 2006 basically looked at what England was doing under Blair and did the opposite. <laughs> um, which actually it, it isn't a good policy. Um, <laughs> e even, if, even if Blair had been wrong more often, it wouldn't have been a good policy. It's, it's, not, kind of, it's, not, it's not a sound basis for... For, for working through. So what they ended up doing, so, they, so in schools they abolished league tables, they didn't do delivery approach, they hated choice, they didn't um, reform the health service. They basically said, well, we've got 22 local authorities, which by the way is too many, and then we've, uh, and then we've got all these professionals, we'll give them some money, we'll be nice to them, and everything will work. That's trust and altruism. And Gwyn Bevan has studied that in the natural experiment in the United Kingdom, but there's lots of other evidence. So it's what basically what happens in the school system in India um, and in Ghana um, and in lots of other parts of the public service. And the truth is, it doesn't really work. It doesn't. It, it's okay for stability, but it doesn't change things. So if you're not happy with the performance, it's not going to work on its own. Um, it's one of those things. It would be nice if it worked, but it doesn't. It does work in some occasional circumstances like the Finnish education system. But Finland is a very quirky system. They've really worked hard at getting the best people uh, graduating from university in, in Finland into the school system. Um, it's pretty homogenous society. It's a very small society. Everybody's tax return is online. Uh, if you get stopped by the police, they can fine you on the spot. But before they give you the fine, they check your tax return and the fine will be bigger if your income is bigger. So this is quite an unusual place. So what I say, <laughs> if you're trying to build a policy around Finland, my advice is like on those television shows, don't try this at home. <laughs> so trust and altruism, it's a way forward and it'd be nice if it worked, but on the whole it doesn't. The second one is, I mentioned hierarchy and targets. This is Gwyn Bevan's language. We, we used to call it command and control. You decide you're going to tell people what to do. It's broadly what we did with waiting times in the first phase of the Blair NHS reform, just for an example. So, and it's particularly good if you want to move something from awful to adequate. So if something's not very good, you want to make it better, you mandate it. But you have to do it well, and there's a whole implementation architecture associated with it. But um, Grim Bevan says that can work in certain circumstances. And, and by the way, he's not the only evidence. That there's other evidence you can pull together. And then, and then this is where, this is the transition the Blair administration went through basically from trust and altruism, uh, although to hierarchy and targets and then to choice and competition. And this is where all Blair's language about moving from uh, flogging the system to a self-sustaining system or a, a system that improves itself. And that's what was attempted with the health reforms. I think actually largely successful and to some extent um, in the education system with the introduction of academies and so on. But choice doesn't work as well in education as it does in health because once you've chosen a school for your child, on the whole, you'd like them to stay there for seven years. You don't want to swap schools too often. So choice is a, a less powerful pressure on the system because of that. So but anyway, that, so that was that. And then, and then if you remember, those of you that, that there must be somebody in the audience that read Gordon Brown's 2003 speech at the Social Market Foundation. <laughs> Hands up. <Many> yeah. <laughs> uh, Anyway, it was, it was one of his longer lectures, and, um, <laughs> but it's actually, it's, it's actually a very, very thoughtful piece of work. And he said, uh, ri ri written by Balls, but in active consultation with Nick, Nick McPherson and, and me, I, um, I, I should add. And um, when Gordon got into something, you'd, like, he, he wouldn't talk to you for ages, and then suddenly, like, every day he'd be on the line, and he'd be rushing up. To anyway, so we, we, did, we worked on this speech, and he was saying, which is a good point, well, you can do command and control, and I understand that those circumstances. And choice and competition, yeah, I can see some circumstances there. But what do you do with, I mean, he, he would have applied this to health, but what do you do with a prison service or a court system where, lot, or a police service? Choice and competition isn't really, I mean, you might be able to con contest stuff. You can put things out to, out to, to tender. 
but, but choice is not going to be the pressure that drives that. So um, we talked about devolution and transparency based on the New York City Police Department, devolve to your precincts, give the precinct commanders control and a lot of discretion, hold them to account every two weeks by checking the data, inviting them in. Uh, you invite one of the precinct commanders to present in front of all of his peers. You're in New York, so everybody's very rude and direct. Um, this guy says, I've cleared the litter in my patch. And one of the, you know, Bratton, who's back now, by the way, is New York City Police, uh, since, since the new mayor came in, says, well, here's a photograph I took yesterday on your patch. Look at this pile of litter. What are you going to do about it? And all the others are laughing at the guy. And the guy goes away and fixes it. Uh, but also, it's a very fast way of, ch of, of, of moving best practice. Because if, if this guy's got something really good to say, all the others think, wow, I'm going to do that next week. So devolution and transparency can work. Um, uh, and uh, there was some of that in the school system, devolving the budgets out to the head teachers, publishing their results, being able to intervene if necessary. And the, the thing is, in a big service like the health service, you might be using all of these at once. So you, you're, you're introducing choice. You're having devolution and transparency anyway. And then for a really, like a mid-staffs crisis, you really want to go straight into the intervention. So these are paradigms. They're not complete choices, but they're ways of thinking about this. And then it dawned on me that, of course, if you were totally frustrated with a public service, like, for example, um, the early Thatcher governments with um, telecoms, energy, whatever, you can privatise it. So there's a fifth paradigm. And it's quite... Uh, so some of you have probably read Nigel Lawson's uh, memoirs. Very, very interesting debate about when you privatise and how you do it. And at the time, there were loads of people in the nationalised industries, chairmen appointed by the Thatcher government, saying, no, no, let's keep tinkering around with the improvement and, you know, we, maybe we can do one of these other... They, they didn't have the five paradigms, but talking, you know, if we get one more improvement plan, it'll be all right. And they say, no, we're fed up with this. We're just going to get them off the books. They needed the money anyway because they wanted to use the family silver to pay the mortgage, as it were. So all of those pressures were in. But basically, when I thought it through, I may be wrong about this, and you can advise me, that in these big services you're changing, as opposed to where you're just banning um, smoking, there are only five ways of doing it, and those are, that's it. I mean, you can combine them, but there's no... Is, is there anything big missing from that? Well, what was, I tried this out once on somebody, and they said, well, yeah, there is one other thing. It's really, really important, and it's this. Like if, you can get the, if you can get the people around, it might be, you might be engaging them with choice or you might be engaging them with, um, you know, they decide to jog more often or go to the gym more often as opposed to just join the gym and not go. Uh, all of those things about engagement and mobilisation can affect the performance of this. And this may be a very, very important thing if you haven't got a lot of money. Like if people will take responsibility for their own health as opposed to come to you and get a tablet um, or whatever it might be or the parent will read with the child at home, so you need to spend less on intervening to get the child to read at school. This may be, it, it, it'd be a good in itself, but it may be particularly important um, at a time of, um, uh, of constraint, which might be why, but I, I don't know this, I'm just speculating, it might be why the whole sort of big society concept was developed anyway. So I just set that out as a kind of model. And if you're changing a big service anywhere in the world, my question to you is, is anything missing from that? So that's the first bit. That's getting the policy right. Um, and then I show this. Some of you have seen this from Instruction to Deliver. Basically, you are going to choose among those things partly by how good the service is. And uh, if you have a four-point scale, we had a four-point scale for everything in the delivery unit, awful, adequate, good, great. Um, the better it gets, the harder it is to mandate. Like The, the English language will let you say, I am going to mandate adequacy. The English language will not let you say, I am going to mandate greatness. You cannot say, I mandate you to be great. It just doesn't work. It's, impossible. it's, it's just an impossible concept. You have to unleash greatness. You have to create the circumstances in which greatness uh, comes through. So as a system gets better, you need to change the mix of the five paradigms that you're going to use. That's the point of this. I remember a conversation with Blair. I can't remember exactly when it was, probably in 2004, when... We've been one of the minor targets we've been looking at was improving fine enforcement. And it had been 50%, which is terrible. It's definitely awful. And it got to 75%. And I reported this to Blair in one of my meetings with him. He said, we should put a press release out on that. And I said, do you want to tell the British people that we don't collect 25% of the fines? I mean, that is not great, is it? So we, we had gone from awful to adequate, and the people are still grumbling. 
when you move a service from awful to adequate, they don't say this is absolutely fantastic. They say you should have done that years ago. So this is, this is, these two things are about getting the policy right. And the, the big point is, am I right that there are only five things surrounded by community engagement? And then what is the mix and how does it change as the system gets better? And then we come to delivery. Because getting the policy right, 90% um, is what most politicians think. Right? Oh, oh, we'll work away on the policy, we'll get it right, we'll make the speech, we'll publish the white paper, and then somebody will take care of the implementation over there. But the, um, the truth is, the implementation is kind of 90% of the challenge. This is not a research finding, this is just a kind of emotional statement. <laughs> um, but you've got to get the the emphasis right. So many policies, so many people feel like Victor Chernomirin because they got the policy right, they announced the white paper, maybe they even got great media for a few days and then they were just hoping it would get taken care of uh, and uh, it didn't get care. So, uh, in my first um, month in the Department for Education in 1997, somebody called me um, from the Sheffield bit of the department. He said, I'm from the TVI unit. And I said, I thought you'd been abolished years ago. And he said, no, 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 the TVI was announced in 1983 by Keith Joseph. It spent over a billion pounds and nobody nobody remembered to abolish the unit and it was still there. <laughs> and what they wanted me to do was write a forward for their publication, which I agreed to do, and then we abolished it. <laughs> and then, um, now, so um, the point is really getting political leaders to think about the implementation challenges is very important here. So. Some of you have probably seen this before. This is deliverology stripped down into five questions. I'm going to um, just touch on um, each of these in turn. So being really clear about the priorities. Um, lots of governments and organizations, actually, um, Denise and I um, work in Pearson, which is a big company, getting people, even in big private sector companies, to really prioritize what are the products that matter most and are going to change, change the world. It's not easy. So clear priorities. and clear, measurable goals. So you've got a priority. Wh how do you want to change it? How would you know if you'd succeeded? Um, there's a lot of debate about targets. Um, uh, it, it keeps endlessly getting debated. And there's the two things I want to say about that. One is um, every government sets targets even if they don't use the word. Like, uh, it, within a few months of being elected, David Cameron had made se several speeches saying targets were a really bad thing. They were top down and they were Labour. And then I hear him on the news one summer holiday and he says, I want Britain to be a top five destination for tourism. <laughs> now, I don't, you don't have to call that a target, but that is a target. Um, there's no two ways about it. And any statement like that is effectively a target. So knowing what you're trying to do and how you would know if you're making progress towards it, those, those, are, those are just basic things in government. And if you can't say what you're trying to do, or how you'd know at any given time whether you were making progress towards that goal, you're probably not going to make much difference. If you're Lord Salisbury and your view of the world is um, all changes for the worse, so it's in our interests that as little should happen as possible, as he said in 1900, then obviously you don't need targets. you just got to try and cling on to the present. And after all, you know, it was the, uh, the, the, the gold, the whatever it was, the diamond jubilee, and it was all marvellous. But he was trying to cling on to something. Of course, it all faded away. But if you're trying to change things, you need goals. Second thing, um, once you've decided on your priorities and you've got some clear way of knowing what it is and you don't have to call it a target, but it's pretty close to a target and you've got some measurable thing to move towards, you need a plan. This is, these are statements of the obvious. But Eisenhower's point is right. It's the planning that really matters. It's not, it's not the glossy document with the cover. It's the, it's the fact that you've done the planning and you know who's responsible for what and when they're going to do it by. And if they don't get it done, you'll be able to check and maybe there's a problem or maybe they're just not doing their job, whatever it is. But unless you've got a plan with some milestones, you're not going to get it done. Um, we used to say, we don't, want, we don't mind about the, the quality of the language. We just need to know that it's got actions in it and that somebody's checking it. And if it's got coffee stains on, all the better because that shows it's being used regularly. Now they're probably all on computers. Third thing, you need to know whether something's on track. Is it actually happening? Th th there's th th certainly back then and uh, in Whitehall and around the world, I see this a lot. There might be a plan, but nobody really knows if they're making progress towards it. And I think big data, or, you know, which is changing the world in lots of ways, will affect this. 
but you'd talk to people and they'd say, yeah, well, I think it's working or it's bedding in. You know, there are all these kind of phrases that really meant they didn't quite know. So how do you know if it's working? W w the Punjab education reform that I mentioned, um, 100 million people in Punjab, somewhere between 25 and 30 million children. Nobody knows because there's been no census since 1998. 60,000 government schools with about 60% of the students in and 35 very low-cost private schools, 35,000 very low-cost private schools with about 40% of the children in. We get monthly data from 60,000 schools. I think maybe the only school system in the world where we get monthly data, we get it on attendance of the teachers, attendance of the students, have the facilities been fixed, um, uh, are the lesson plans being used, and so on. Um, now, in the modern world, you might think that would all be computerized, but actually, the way we do this is we have 900 ex-army guys on motorbikes who visit 15 schools a day. That is enough to get 60,000 schools. They have a checklist. They don't have to just go and see the register. They have to count the children. Um, and um, they never get given the same route. They never go to the same school twice in a six-month period, so they can't build a corrupt relationship with the head teachers. And then we double-check their performance periodically. Now, that kind of data system is not going to be perfect, let's be clear, but it's good enough to manage a system. And it means that next week, or week after next, when I sit with the chief minister, uh, which will be the 11th of February, we will have the January data in Lahore from all 60,000 schools. And we will make some decisions and we'll break it down by the 36 districts so we'll know which districts are delivering and which ones aren't. And where they're not delivering, we will ask a question. Um, and the Secretary of Education will have to answer the question or go and find the answer. And my team will be working with the officials next week and I'll get them, we'll go through it all. I'm just saying you can't do this without knowing in real time before that, any and, and, and true in most of the developing world, most education reforms are working on data that is a year or two years out of date. How can you manage with data that old? So this is really important. And then you have to have a monitoring routine. It's no good collecting the data unless you actually ask questions of it. And this is where the stock take meetings that we developed in Downing Street, where we had reviews every two months with each of the key departments that we were looking at, were really important because the data is in front of the prime minister and the m relevant minister, and they have a conversation not about whether the data is accurate, because that's all agreed in advance. What does the data mean? What should we be doing? Is it working? If it's not working, what are we going to do about it? Very, very simply putting that on the agenda. And that's what ha will happen in Punjab on the 11th of February. And it's what happens in Malaysia. Every Monday morning between 11 and 12, the Malaysian Prime Minister has a stock take meeting on one of his six national priorities. So every six weeks, each one of them comes round. And the minister will be there, and the head of the delivery unit, Idris Jala, will be there, and they will go through it, and they'll check. It's a very simple way of making sure whatever crises are happening, this um, program keeps going. Um, and then, obviously, in the ver various routines, and there's lots of other routines, by the way. I should just briefly mention monthly notes. We, um, in the delivery unit, Jeremy Haywood actually said to me in the first few weeks of the delivery, you need to send a monthly note to Tony on each of the key priorities because you've got to get his attention. Um, and so we went away and invented the monthly note. Um, we got them into a kind of standard format so that Tony could read the one page if he was under pressure or he could read four pages and look at the graphs if he had a bit more time. Um, and we got them going. And, it, um, and the first, my staff was resistant. They were saying, well, why can't we just send him a note when we've got something to say? And I said, no, no, that's the whole point of a routine. You've got to say you've got to say it all the time and once we get the data going which took a while we'll always have something to say because the data will have moved and then it gets a bit like looking at the premiership after you know after the saturday games you know, who's up who's down what's it so you get that kind of that kind of process going so i thought we'd invented this and i said to my staff make sure you write them really well and i'll edit them because we've got to capture tony's imagination so i thought we'd invented some device here then i read that brilliant um book by um, Christopher Andrew about the history of MI5. Has anybody read that? It's a quite a fat book, but it's good. You, okay, Kevin, you, you've read. It's, it's not the easiest read, but it is absolutely brilliant. Anyway, so in 1943, MI5 are sitting around saying, Churchill's not giving us enough attention. And one of them says, well, I know. Why don't we write him a monthly note? <laughs> and, um, and then there's a bit of a debate. And then, and then this guy says, well, we've got to get it written really well, because otherwise he'll never read it. And I think, thinking, did this really happen? So then, and, and in Christopher Andrew's book, 
the first monthly note is there, and it's fantastic. It says, in the last month, we've tracked 125 German spies. 34 of them have been turned into double agents. 25 have been eliminated. Some of them are in a court process, but you know they'll get eliminated eventually, um, or whatever it is. Um, it is absolutely riveting note. So, so th but this is, this is the really interesting bit. They said, we've got to get somebody really, really, really good at writing. Um, who do you think they came up with? The, um, God, I've gone blank on his name, suddenly. Um, <laughs> the guy, sorry. <laughs> who, the, so, so th th this, guy w this guy was um, outed in the 1970s when he was running the Queen's Picture Galleries for being a spy. <laughs> Sorry? Not, yeah, yeah, so, so, so they got him to write it. They got, he wrote the monthly note. And, and it's, this is all in Chris Fandra's book, he cleared the monthly note to Churchill with the Russians before it went to Churchill. <laughs> we never thought of that. I and mean, that is absolutely fantastic. So just imagine, so from 1943 to 1945, they wrote a monthly note to Churchill that was cleared with the Russians and then sent to Churchill. That is fantastic. You couldn't make that up. So anyway, monthly notes are really important. Um, even, even Peter Hennessy doesn't know that, John. <laughs> you tell him. Uh, so um, if you're not on track, yeah, so you've got to, you, you, you've, once you've identified a problem, you've got to do something about it. Now here, there's an interesting philosophical difference, wi which I've debated with Michael Goh between this government and the Blair administration. Because when we came up with a problem, we thought, well, what are we going to do about it? As it says there, we, we, would, we would try something, and then if that didn't work, we'd try something else. And there's a lot to be said for that, because you learn from your, uh, hopefully you get it right first time, but if you don't, you learn from your failures and then eventually you get it right. Michael Gove, who I, I think is, is actually rather good at delivery, um, he says there are some problems where you just, let's see what happens. And that, that, may, that may be a kind of underlying difference between a kind of Labour administration, or a new Labour administration anyway, and a, and a Conservative administration, I'm not, I'm not sure. So they're, they're, I've raised problems with Michael Gove, and he says, well, we'll just see what happens. And that may be part of getting to the paradigm of, of unleashing greatness, where you've, if you've got a system broadly set up a problem, well, maybe the system will sort it out for itself. But we were a bit activist, and maybe we were over-activists at some time. But anyway, you do need to know whether the problem is being solved, even if you're not solving it. And then the fifth bit is a set of questions f that a delivery unit asks. So um, or, or, or how can we help? We're going to keep the ambition. If we didn't believe in the targets, nobody else was going to. Um, we're going to focus on the goals. We're going to maintain the routines. So when, on the odd occasion when Tony couldn't do a stock take, I did the stock take. It still carried on. Um, and then we'd work with the departments to help solve the problems. And we learnt about delivery. We became a centre of expertise in how to deliver. So not in health policy or education policy. There were thousands of those people around. We were experts in how to get things done. Uh, and that was really, uh, it's, it gets missed uh, I even in the current administration, actually. So um, I've nearly uh, done now, um, and I just want to uh, say one other thing. A big part of this is about, so this is the political will, but if you've got a political uh, leader with real will to make a change, you can still screw it up if you don't use the leader's time well enough. Everybody who's worked in Whitehall and government around the world knows that the leader's time is more precious than money. It's the biggest, most powerful resource you've got. So if you can focus it on the right things, you're going to make much more difference. Whereas if you run around uh, just fighting fires, dealing with crises, you might have lots of political will, but you won't get the focused uh, impact of it. So what we've been doing, uh, the, the Chief Minister in Punjab is a model of this, the Prime Minister in Malaysia is a model of it, Tony Blair was a model of it uh, on domestic policy. Y if you've got the small amounts of time and you focus them effectively, um, you can really make a difference. And this is what I um, have been talking about with the Chief Minister. 100 hours, he doesn't need that for the education reform, but we're now going to apply it to some other areas. 100 hours of his time a year, like two hours a week. It's a small price to pay to deliver your priorities. Um, and then the, the, the point about power and investing it rather than spending it. This was a phrase we used in the delivery a lot. You can do the West Wing thing of the president's incandescent or whatever it, the latest um, <laughs> phrase is. But actually that's spending power. Every time you do that, you're not really building the power of the present, you're using it up. Now, maybe for a particular moment, that's what you've got to do. But if you go to a minister or an official and say, uh, you know, 
w you know and we know and the Prime Minister knows that this isn't really working, but let's work through how we're going to solve this problem and um, we're going to use your time really efficiently and this meeting's not going to be very long, but we just want to get to the bottom of the problem. So I used to say to my staff, they'll always let you in because you work for the Prime Minister, but when you're in there, you're on your own and how good you can be. And if, you're re if that really works, then the official tells the minister, or if it's with the minister, the minister tells the prime minister, they say those people from the delivery are really helpful. They're challenging, they're persistent, they don't go away unless we've solved the problem, but you can't fault their quality or their insight. That's investing the power, because then they tell the prime minister that you're good at it, and then he says, it's great that you're doing good work, and then the next time you go, you've got that much more social capital, and so you get an upward spiral. So I think, think power is not a zero sum, mm. that's the basic message. and then. Summarising it all, I actually just want to, some of you read I've Anthony King's and Ivor Crew's book about the blunders of our government. I don't know if you did this, Kevin, but um, when I bought the book, I did, academics always do this, they don't always admit it, I looked myself up in the index first. <laughs> it was one of those books, when, when the, the title is The Blunders of Our Government, so I was actually quite relieved not to be in the index um, <laughs> on, on this occasion. Um, but they've got some... So some of the stories, are, they're not quite right, I don't think, but, but some of them are. But these are some of their lessons. So they say there's a disconnect that the people in the, at the centre of government don't really know what it's like out there in the real world. They misunderstand what it's like to be a teacher or a doctor or, or, or a patient. Uh, you get a kind of group thing. Everybody runs around reinforcing their own prejudices. Blair, actually, I think, was rather good at getting people to challenge him, uh, but not all prime ministers are, um, and so on. I won't go through all of these. And then, you, and then you get these kind of reactions where you have a policy in reaction to a crisis, and we've all seen that. Anybody who's worked in any government knows that. But one of the, I do wonder, that a def they, they talk about a deficit of deliberation, so there's not sufficient, they say, having looked at dozens of blunders through the Thatcher, Major, uh, Blair and Brown administrations. I thought they made a good point here, but what they didn't get, because I, I reflected, if you have routine stock takes, actually you are, you're correcting this. And it's interesting, none of the things that are in the delivery unit portfolio appear in their book at all. S and I don't think we did have big disasters. Uh, we, we had things that could have gone better, but we didn't have big disasters. And the deficit of deliberation, it, it, but once you've got a kind of routine and, p and the, the data's there, so you have to face the facts, you can have a proper debate. And if you don't get it quite right last time, you can fix it next time. So in the, um, in the Punjab reform, there's this big local government reform going on that I've been a bit worried about because it will get in the way, I, I feared, of the roadmap. And we've debated that in three or four stock takes with the Chief Minister and the policy is being adjusted. It's a big political commitment, so they're definitely going to do it. But how you do it, getting it right, working it through, how will it overlap with the education roadmap? All of that, we've got so much better at it because we keep coming back to it. So I think we are addressing that part. Uh, and I think we did in the Blair Downing Street on uh, the priorities. And then, and then this is just a summary of everything I said. So um, I used to accuse uh, the Blair number 10 in the first term of being government by spasm. Not clear what, they, uh, what, what, what mattered most. Vague aspirations, lots of crisis management, guessing, post-hoc evaluation, you know, it's all, it's all there. And what we were trying to move to, uh, towards over time was what I call government by routine, which is less exciting if you're a journalist, but much more effective if you're a government, and much, much better if you're a citizen, because you're actually going to get some results. Um, so that's, that's it, John. Um, <laughs> back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Very much. Not, not least because John Rental is in the room. I just want to put my, um, my Twitter handle up. And if anybody wants to debate this with me, feel free. <laughs> okay, we have 20 minutes of questions, 20, 22 minutes. Um, can you state name and institution? And clearly there's somebody who wants to speak there. Sorry. <laughs> Please. Hello, hello. Tom Robinson, former student of uh, QMU uh, and of both Johns that QML. are stood here. QML. That's the new branding. Oh, University of London. Keep up. Okay. Mm. <laughs> and I read um, Blunders of Our Government, and all I could think of throughout that talk was Ivor Crew and um, I can't remember the second Anthony writer, King. Anthony, Anthony King. King. Yeah. And I thought you provided the solution for what they come to in their final chapter, and they say, We're not sure what the, lo the solution is, but we have provided you with the problems. And I thought your lecture just then was absolutely fantastic Thank in relation to that book. So here is my question. Uh, last year, me off, <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, 
Last year, Lord Armstrong was interviewed by the MyLM Group and he stated that the Blair government started and continued in tears. And he was referring to your, the units and their relation with the civil service. Do you think that that was a fair criticism? Well, um, can I just, just um, mention the, the first bit of that, um, the, the, the complimentary bit first. And <laughs> then, uh, um, look, the, um, it's, what would I, what would I say? I, I think um, the blunders of our government is, uh, one of the things I kind of regret that they invited me to a seminar. I think they did a series of seminars in the preparation of that book, and I, I just they gave one for the Myling Group, right? And I, I just yeah. couldn't go to it, and, and I do kind of regret that. Of course, I would then have appeared in the index because if I'd really crystallized, and they may have criticised, but they talk about strengthening the centre, don't they? Which is interesting, um, and I think some are, I, I do actually. This sounds terribly self-serving. I do actually agree that something like a well-run delivery unit would help solve some of the problems. So I'm not putting any any stronger than that. I, I also think that um, that um, the Blair administration never quite got the centre sorted out. And in, in the last chapter of instruction to deliver, I talk about what I thought it should have evolved into, but it, that, that never came about. Um, and it was a bit incoherent. I do think, and I think there's quite a lot of evidence for this. If you look at the, um, the memoirs that have come out um, since uh, from cabinet ministers, but also if you talk to the, the relevant senior civil servants, not all of them, but, but most of them, would say the delivery unit was different, was effective, did help them, didn't get in the way. We, did, we actually got every year, w we the delivery unit commissioned from some independent people, we'd get them to go and interview this relevant senior civil servants and ministers and tell them uh, that they could say anything because they wouldn't be quoted and we'd get a picture of what was working and what wasn't, we'd adjust it. So I know that we had good relationships and even places where the relationship got edgy because we were pushing them not necessarily to do uh, or, or it, it just took a while to get to the right place. The relationships were strong and we, we thought a lot about the quality of the relationships. We had training for the staff in how to do relationships, conflict resolution, all of that. Um, so it, it, it did work and I've seen since delivery units that didn't work where you set up the unit, you get the agenda but you don't get the relationships right and it goes horribly wrong. And I think some of what the Blair government did at the, the, at the centre did have some of the the, the the problems that Lord Armstrong was referring to. Down here, please. If you can just wait for the microphone. I'm Jennifer Gold with the Institute for Government. I wonder you've touched on various innovations abroad, and I just wonder, in respect of anything that you've seen, particular innovations in the way they've adapted the model, that you think would have improved the effectiveness of PDMU during your time? Yes, yes. Thank you, Jennifer. There, there, there are there are a couple of things I've seen in Malaysia that are really great. Um, one is the which we didn't do in 2001. The Prime Minister in Malaysia, he, he, he became Prime Minister in I think in 2007. It might be 2008 and he was re-elected last year. But he, he, he was pretty decisive about what he wanted, what became the six national, they call them key results areas, A NKRAs. But he did it through a series of workshops with the cabinet. So they had, they had I think, four workshops. That I, I certainly attended three workshops with the cabinet to arrive at, so, so they were collectively arrived at. Um, he, he, he led very clearly, but he involved and engaged the cabinet and the cabinet were interviewed independently, each of them individually, uh, that was brought to bear and then they made decisions. Whereas we basically, Blair said I want to do these things and then I went off to negotiate with Ed Balls and Gordon Brown and see what we could arrive at and w w so we w it was a little bit more um, hit and miss. However, in, in 2001 there had just been an election campaign and Tony really, you know, whatever else you might criticise Blair for, sensitivity to the electorate isn't one of them. <laughs> And he really knew what people were worrying about. And so that had informed decisions. So you could say he'd been very consultative in, in, in that way. Um, so, but that was interesting. And I, I think you could do more with the cabinet. The cabinet got to like the delivery agenda. And I used to report to them periodically. And it was always a very um, positive uh, experience. But they hadn't been really actively engaged in the thing. So that was one thing. And then the second thing is Idris Jala invented, because he'd, he'd worked for Shell in the past. He, he invented this thing called labs, which is that you get about 50 people, some experts, um, some people from the field, whether it's a health system or a transport system, whatever, and um, you lock them effectively in a hotel for six weeks. <laughs> and you say, 
this is what we want to get done. You come up with a policy, and then you sort of provide them with data, and the prime minister will drop in, and the relevant minister will spend quite a lot of time there. And at the end of it, you come up with a plan. Um, I haven't tried it, but it seemed to work for him. Um, slightly, I mean, I think he's, he's been, he is absolutely brilliant. They slightly overdo like a list of initiatives as opposed to a coherent one of the five paradigms or a combination of the five paradigms. But, the, but that idea, I think, is quite good. If you, if you need a policy under pressure, there's no, there's no deficit of deliberation in that. You know, six, six weeks of intensive work. And then you've got statisticians and you can send researchers off and they'll come back with the, the stuff. So th 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 those are two innovations I've seen. At the back, please. Uh, Patrick Ford. Patrick Ford, um, I'm a mere uh, undergraduate. Um, <laughs> if you look at a company like Google, they obviously invest massive amounts in research and development, which means that um, they are kind of um, innovative and they're able to kind of use blue sky thinking and they're able to think out outside of the box and um, there's a lot of talk about how failure is actually encouraged there because if you fail once or twice you, you're more likely to stumble upon the solution so my question is is failure tolerated in your job and is it encouraged because clearly it's politically unpalatable yeah <laughs> it's, it's difficult um, and by the way there's no such thing as a mere undergraduate oh uh, you say that <laughs> Uh, I, I published um, a document with, with uh, two colleagues and friends last year called An Avalanche is Coming About the Future of Universities, and we talk about the student consumer is king. So think of yourself, <laughs> as, think of yourself as king uh, um, and, um, and inheriting a totally worthwhile debt when you leave. Um, uh, as long as he's your tutor, that is. Um, so, um, but, but look, um, well, th this is difficult actually because it, it's, you know, gov government is under a lot of pressure. Um, and failures are very visible, they're very transparent, and they're <coughs> difficult to manage. But, um, but actually, many of the best policies fail, or, you, or the, there's some failure on the way to success, like success is the end of a story. Um, my, my, the, in, in my own personal career, just to give an example, we, 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 right from 1997, were really keen to improve education in London and the other big cities. Uh, as a particular, we wanted to improve education generally, but specifically do that. So in 1997 and 8, we had education action zones. They largely failed. Uh, in 2000, 2001, or 99, 2001, we had excellence in cities, which worked in some places, but not in others, and made incremental progress. And then we hit on the London challenge which has transformed education in London. So London is now the best performing region. Bangladeshi students have overtaken uh, the average. Pakistani students have narrowed the gap. This is a globally known uh, example. One of the few capital cities in the world where the, 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 the capital city perform, outperforms the nation on education. Warsaw's another. So, but if we hadn't had the two failures, we would never have come up with the design of the London Challenge. We had learned from sometimes bitter experience. We'd had interventions in Hackney and Islington. Some, you know, Hackney didn't really work, Islington worked better. So we, we learned a lot. And I think you, one of the things a really good minister can do is create the space to try things out and fail. And if the minister's got the language and the ability to defend it in public, you can get through it. Um, but, the, but what it involves distinguishing between is that kind of failure from a kind of catastrophic failure where you're going around saying this is really, really going to work and then you end up with a crisis. And that's why the regular data and the stock takes and all that are really helpful. But it is harder than Google. <laughs> At the back, please. Uh, John Tolson from the Defence Intelligence Division of the Ministry of Defence. And we know a great deal about deliberate failure. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I wanted to, to ask, given that what, what you describe is a very sorry r rational approach to to how you can measure things better do things better how far do you think that is applicable to all or most levels of public administration is it the kind of thing that works down to parish council level for instance or is there an optimum optimum place in the system where you from your experience think it works best well, it's, it's a great question, and uh, my, my, so my start, I, I haven't tried it out in a parish council, but, I, but I, my starting point is that the basic approach should work pretty much anywhere, but I just want to say something in the way of, it, it's, it's, it's a, an approach 
designed to work around the leadership of whatever the system is. So if you're a council leader, um, uh, you, could, you could use something like this. You'd adapt it to the person and the processes in that council. But the basic idea of identifying priorities, getting some planning done, building some routines to check progress, in, uh, intervening or solving the problems as they arise and so on, that would work. And um, so I don't think it depends on the level of government, but it is seen from the leader's point of view. And sometimes that leads people who are criticizing it to say it's top down. But actually, it's not top down. It's just, you know, if you are a leader, you're at the, you're at the top of a system. But you, you could use the process to drive <coughs> a bottom up policy, but you still need the same process. So it's seen from the leader's perspective looking out. But I think, I, I, I don't know about parish council, I do know of, um, like I spent, um, a few months ago, a few uh, uh, an afternoon, a long afternoon, uh, and very productive with a with a group of schools in Bristol, and they were we were just th th they'd invited me and we went through how would this work in that and they were thrilled to bits with it and there's um so that the, you could use it at the level of a school and the level of a government and anything in between and actually um, Denise and I in our work in Pearson I, are applying some aspects of this into a large corporation. Uh, Kevin Tebbit, who also used to work in the Ministry of Defence at one stage. Um, I wonder, I try and turn it into a question because I could observe all night and you get all bored, but um, I wonder if you think one thing that is rather important that might not have been mentioned or perhaps by implication in your you know, tremendous analysis actually, and by the way, I, I felt the delivery unit did tremendously well. There were all sorts of problems, but it wasn't caused by the delivery right. unit, um, is the word inclusiveness inclusiveness in policy formation as well as implementation. And the reason I ask that is because it seemed to me, as I sort of observed this from where I sat in the MOD, which was sort of semi-detached, because a lot of this was about domestic policy implementation, yeah. that things worked pretty well when one had, as it were, all of your delivery agents inside the boundary of government. Where the delivery agents were outside the boundary, it was tremendously hard to do it. It compounded the problems because you couldn't pull the levers and see them pulling the signals up and down at the other end. It was a much bigger challenge. And I wonder if you thought that was one of the difficulties of ensuring that you can actually get your arms around, in terms of leadership, all of the agents, as it were, who are going to have to put this into place. And to put it in a microcosm, I always felt that one of the weaknesses of Tony Blair's approach was that he sometimes forgot, uh, and they, uh, characterized by sofa government, it wasn't really that, that you do need people in the room to have their hands where dipped in the blood if you really want them to go out and sell it seriously. Yeah. And sometimes, because largely because of the Brown-Blair relationship, possibly some others, uh, that didn't happen. And I felt that that was often one of the key reasons why some policies worked well others much less successfully. Yes, well, it's a very good point. And, and actually, in answering um, Jennifer's question, I was talking about um, how Najib Razak had included the entire cabinet in arriving at the priorities. So that would be, that would, that's be a, a, a small example of, uh, of what you're talking about. And I, I, think it's pr I think it's true that on the whole, um, w w on the whole, re a relatively you know, Blair, Blair basically did a lot from number 10 with a relatively small number of people around him. And um, so th th there's an element in that. On the other hand, when you got it out into the system, whether it was um, a totally government system or something much broader like the school system or the railway system, um, the delivery approach worked pretty well in the end. And um, what w the, the, there were two barriers. And, and so, no, so be I'm, I'm agreeing with your basic thesis which the, the people who are going to have to do this need to be so in, in some way engaged. But there were two barriers we had to overcome. Uh, to, to, to take the railway system as an example, the, 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 the Department for Transport in 2001, remembering that a few years earlier it had privatised the railway, didn't think it was its job to improve the performance of the railways. They'd given up. And we were saying from number 10, but we subsidise this railway enormously. Where are we, how are we making sure the taxpayer gets a return from that? Quite apart from the fact <coughs> that the, the passengers are all constituencies of our MPs. What, wh where, where is the return on the investment? And we had to turn around the psychology in the Department for Transport 
to think, yes, actually, it is our job to try to improve the railway system, but we'll have to do it with this system with 22 train operating companies and different people owning the track. And it took, that took a couple of years to really get people to understand. And then, and then out in the system, the 22 train operating companies said, why, why should we, we, you know, we're in competition, why should we collaborate? And we said, well, because they all hate you um, and we're spending a lot of money on you and unless you work together, we're never going to fix this thing. And so we finally uh, got there. So, so there was a psychology thing and the, the, the lack of levers was a, a well-known complaint. And we, we, said, we kept saying, you can't use that as an excuse. You have to find a way of getting it done because we made a commitment as a government, your minister made a commitment that we're going to do this. So you might not have the levers that you would like to have, but what are you going to do with the leverage you do have? Get into the psychology of working on it. So we, um, we solve leaves on the line, for example. Um, um, I can tell you how if you want. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, uh, but, the, so, but you do, and then, and then the other thing about engaging people, there's two stages to it. So, and, and a quite a typical thing to happen in a civil service driven policy that fails is you say, yes, we've got to get buy-in or engagement. Uh, and here's our policy, and then we'll go and consult this union and that union and that stakeholder group and that. And oh yeah, we'll sacrifice that bit of it here and that bit of it there. And the policy gets kind of slowly narrowed down and watered down, and then it doesn't work because it's not the original concept. So that way of getting buy-in, I know that's not what you were saying, but that's that's the kind of standard practice when you when you're trying to include people in. On the other hand, if you can get people inside in dialogue with you and saying, we've got to solve this problem, how are we going to do it? Let's have a debate about it. But you've got somebody who says, hang on, that's not going to work. You, and, and you can get the debate that's very real. It's got to work, so let's not just make some messy compromise. Let's do it. That, I think, is going to. And that's what Idris Jala's uh, labs do as well, because he gets everybody, all fif you know, 50 people representing all these. So at the end of this, I need a solution to this problem. So I think there are different ways of doing it. And I, I, I buy your main point. Please. Anne Perkins from The Guardian. Um, I wonder if you could say a bit more about delivery in an age of austerity, and particularly delivery when you might uh, say you're delivering a better service, but most people think you're just delivering cuts, and maybe with particular reference to universal credit? Well, I, <laughs> I can't help you with universal credit, because apart from reading your newspaper uh, and others, <laughs> I, I have actually, I, have, I really don't know what's Master. going on. Well, no, no, honestly, I'm, I'm not. I'm not using an excuse just because you're a journalist. I just haven't really thought it through. So, but I, but and, and I literally know no more than a, uh, a sort of semi-interested uh, newspaper reader. Uh, but the, w w but what I do, um, I do think about your main, your main, um, your main point is that um, this, this delivery approach should, um, you know, like I, I, I think. Well, let me come back to this administration. I think if they, I, I, I think they, they aren't sufficiently rigorous about delivery in, in, in too many areas. So I, 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 I make an exception of Michael Gove. Um, I know he's a very controversial figure, but he is really delivering and he's, he's got the concept and he, he does it well. Um, I think t too often the, the, the delivery challenges haven't been thought through far enough ahead. I don't know if that applies to universal credit, but but it, it, it may well be the case. Did you, sorry, do you want to come, come back? <laughs> no, I, I don't want to look sceptical, so... Come to, 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 to. Um, I mean, I think that's a very interesting observation. Um, I, I mean, one of the things that uh, is supposed to be a kind of a substitute for having cut spend money to start is this kind of, ex it, it seems to be this extreme degree yeah. of accountability yeah. that's being denied. Yeah. No. Well, so, I, I, no, to me, to me, there's um, there's no reason at all why we shouldn't be able to deliver much better results for less money. That is what's happening in the rest of the world. That, no, no, I don't mean in government. In, in outside of government, no, nobody thinks if we spend less money, we won't be able to get better results. That, that you know, we, we heard about Google a moment ago. Companies like that are delivering the, the, the power of technology. All kinds of things should enable us to deliver more and more for for less or the same money. And um, uh, by the way, the engagement, the community engagement bit, going beyond Tevin, Kevin, Kevin's point, should be a really big empowering part of that. So I, I, I think it's really more important. What I'm um, toying with uh, or, or trying to work on, but haven't got cracked quite yet, is a, a thing called a, 
a productivity review that would look at the outcomes that you want alongside the inputs, the, the money that you're inventing. In the very last few pages of Instruction to Deliver, I kind of mapped that out in a few pages. And I wish the Treasury had taken it up then, because they would be really good at it by now. It was just an idea. But basically, for any service, you, there are three things, three outcomes you want. There's whatever the goals are, as in set by delivery. There's um, public confidence. You want people to say, yeah, that's a good service. So, and you need to work on that. In Ontario, in the education system, they explicitly set, set public confidence in the system as one of their goals. And then thirdly, you want to know that the organization itself is getting healthier. So you're not hollowing it out to deliver a short-term result. See what I mean? So that's three outcomes, a result, public engagement, and a healthy organization. And then the input is the, so if you imagine though those three above a line on a division, and then under, underneath it would be, the, would, would be the input. And the more you could get the top above the line to improve while holding the thing below, the more your productivity would go up. Do you see what I mean? It's a bit mathematical. But I'm trying to work through how you could actually apply that kind of system. And at some point, it will be a four-point scale. For sure. Um, now, when, when Alistair Campbell came and we only had five minutes left, he took 35 questions. Okay. And he did about five and a half minutes he okay. did, he did it, it in. Um, I've got to be so brief, though, haven't I? If you can, yeah. yeah. So if you can keep your questions brief as well, and we'll take as many as possible. Who's over here, please? Over, over there. Yeah, yeah, you should, I think. It's for our recording. Hi, my name's Anik. I'm one of the master's students here studying I didn't public. Your name. Anik. Anik. And um, I'm just wondering, we talk about c uh, controversial targets um, or the controversy around targets. How do you allow for bad targets? And kind of uh, Tony Blair saying, you know, that you could hit the target, m miss the point. How do you allow for that and not hollow out the system, make sure that you leave a healthy system behind? Yeah, well, well the, 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 so I'm doing a brief answer. We had too many targets at the beginning, which is a bad thing. And we had some bad targets, which is obviously a bad thing. And then on the, mi the target and the missing the point, the, the this is what we, we always said this in the minute. The point is that children can read and write well. That's what we want. We represent it as a target that says 80% of children will get level four in national curriculum English. But the target isn't the point. The point is the changed world. And well, you have to, because the target, it, it, you, you have to have a, um, a, a moral purpose. And you have to convey that moral purpose to the people who are working on it. They have to believe that this is a mission worth undertaking. And the target is a representation of that. Who else over there? No, done. All right, that's done. Okay, Alice there. <laughs> Come on, chop chop. <laughs> uh, Alice McDonald, formerly at uh, DTI. My question almost follows on from the last question. Uh, I mean, in recent press reports here of the um, the police distorting crime figures um, to look good. Uh, of people in the National Health Service distorting waiting lists and operational yeah. information to look good. Yeah. Uh, teachers sometimes um, massaging league table results to look good. When you were in number 10 and when you were advising people around the world, people who haven't got 67,000 people with motorbikes... Um, 900. Uh, 900, yeah. sorry. Um, how do you... How did you decide, how do you advise people on which statistics you should believe and which are absolutely distorted? Yeah, it's, well, it's really important that, uh, this is uh, a quick, quick, quick question. One is, if you're, a health, uh, if you're a health service professional or an education professional and you distort the statistics to look good, you're betraying the children or the patients. That is unethical and that is a really important point. Secondly, um, we never, we, we always tried to say, well, the target's got to be, whatever target we're looking at will be, there'll be a particular defined data set, but we'll always check against other data sets to see whether the distortions here are, are, are actually distortions or whether they're just, they're, they're, they're kind of, it's always going to get be some cheating in some system. So for example, on crime, we had the recorded crime figures, but we also had the British Crime Survey. The target was in the recorded crime figures, but in the British Crime Survey, once you'd worked out the relationship between the two, you could track the recorded crime would go down first, and the crime survey would re re record it later. And so you knew that broadly what you were seeing was true. On the key stage four, key stage two results for 11-year-olds, you saw them going up. Um, people said you were cheating, even though you weren't. Obviously, there may have been the odd school out of the 19,000 primary schools cheating. But then you saw the international comparison go up 
10 year olds, so not even the same age group, totally independent survey, that goes up too. You think, well, this is okay. So always triangulating the data and then periodically auditing the entire data system. So right now in Punjab, we're auditing the 900 men on motorbikes and making sure that they're not all um, completely sorting it. There probably will be a bit of inflation in there, to be honest, but, but the, the broad picture is good enough to manage the system. Okay, down the front here, please. Mark Kidson from the Institute for Government. Um, we're working on a project on policy implementation, which I think is the politically correct word for delivery <laughs> nowadays. Um, but just on your paradigms, um, what is hard to see in there is sort of collaboration. And the London Challenge is one of the examples you mentioned. There were lots of the routines that you talk about and lots of the sort of detailed work. But there was also a lot of m recognition that the, a lot of the capacity was already in the system and it was about spreading it around. When you're looking at it from the leader's perspective, is that just a paradigm you, you can't see? And uh, is that a problem for, for your five? Uh, it's, a good, it's, a good, it's a very good point. Actually, I, think, I think it's, pro I would pr probably argue that it was part of devolution and transparency. So you're devolving responsibility and saying to the system, you sort this out among yourselves. And, um, but it's true that actually from government in the London Challenge, we created the collaboration. We, we, we encouraged or incentivized the collaboration. So it, it, it probably is a um, something I should add into the way of explaining that and think through how it could be represented on there. But the, but the other thing to say is, don't forget about the London Challenge, that in addition to that, there was the academies. So my borough, Hackney, which now exceeds the national average at primary and secondary level, five academies out of nine secondary schools make a big difference. You know, when, when, I was, when my children were that age, I was fighting to get my children out of Hackney schools. Now parents are fighting to get them in. Hackney is overtaking Camden. You should ask Alistair Campbell and Fiona Miller about that as well, by the way. Uh, um, so, Lovely, please. Um, <coughs> so Susanna from Civil Service World. Um, thinking again, sort of this international comparator piece, do you think there is a particular systematic weakness in the British Civil Service that would inhibit delivery, or one, one that you see as the greatest weakness? Conversely, what do you think is the greatest strength of our particular system that we should build on to help us be better at delivery? Well, the first thing to say, having worked in 40-odd um, countries, is the British Civil Service is really, is really good <coughs> internationally. Compared to so I, d I don't go to other civil services and think, God, I wish the British Civil Service was <laughs> like this. They're, they're really good. First of all, ethically, they're fantastic, uh, which is really important. But y when you see what that's like in Pakistan, for example, you realize just how precious that is. We just take that for granted, and we can take it for granted. The civil service works away. They don't, they don't, they're not... Um, overconfident about it, so that's one thing. Secondly, these are really talented people, and so with the right uh, direction, training, development, they can be good. Think the Institute for Government is playing a role. There's, there's lots you can do. They're still recruiting great people into the civil service, so there's lots going for it. What you feel is that it's, um, that it's m m uh, sometimes misdirected, and that within the culture, there's a little bit of a kind of which is obviously exaggerated in Yes Minister, but, the, but it's still there, which is um, our job is to keep everything stable, this will go on forever, this government will come and go, and um, delivering these big ambitious things isn't terribly British. You know, I, 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 this is too long, isn't it? Um, you, you, got, you got about seven minutes, I would have thought. Look, so so he, he, the, the, the same people who wrote Whig history <laughs> invented the modern civil service. They're all called Trevelyan, Tre Trevelyan or Macaulay, right? What is Whig history? Whig history says British history is a very, very slow improvement over several hundred years, and um, mm -hmm. we, had, we beat the Armada, and then things got really fantastic, and we had Victoria, and after that, everything's been a struggle. That is basically... <laughs> Weak history in a si and if that's your mindset, you don't think step change, ambitious goals. You think keep it going, steady as she goes. It'll be all right eventually. We'll muddle through. That is a very British psychology. It is deeply embedded in the civil service. Please, in front here. <coughs> Thanks, um, Carl Pike. I work in Parliament. Um, I IT in Parliament. Pro Parliament yeah. right. IT projects. Uh, which is uh, sometimes very challenging for the government. Um, if you're entrusting a reform to a new gadget, to something external from you know, the department or whatever, how do you ensure it's delivered? Is it just grip, or is there a particular process that you follow? 
Yes, a kind of dread question, isn't it? Um, uh, maybe you should ask President Obama. Um, but the, the, I think, the, I think the, there's, so I haven't got an easy answer. Um, I'm glad to say that I never have felt that responsibility because even now, um, Denise is there, she works with me. But what, what myself say about me, if it involves more than one button, Michael won't be able to do it. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm, I'm not the expert on this, but I think, I think there's, first of all, government needs people on the inside of those contracts who really understand the technology. They really need that, so, and so that's one thing. Secondly, there's a bit of a tendency, and I don't know if this is still true, that once you let a contract in Whitehall, it was kind of off your hands. No company thinks like that. You let a contract and you're all over the contractor all the time. Are they on track? Are they doing it? You're building a partnership, you're building a relationship. You want a relationship where if something's going wrong, they'll tell you soon. All of those things go wrong, and so it, the, the, the problem compounds. I don't know if this is what's happening with universal credit, and then eventually find out, and, but it's too late. And if you've got the routines and the data and the things you're tracking, you're more likely to find that stuff out. But you do need, with an IT project more than anything else probably, you need somebody on the government side who really understands the technology, really understands it. So in a stock take, you'd be, you know, like, I, I would never have known the right questions to ask, but somebody needs to know the right questions to ask in some way of checking where's the evidence that it will work. Okay, Andrew, down the front here, please. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Riley, Churchill College. Uh, a question about the UK scene when you were at number 10. Yeah. Were there too many reshuffles? <laughs> and did it bug you to death? Oh, God, no, don't move him. He's just got there. Um, there, there, there were too many reshuffles, and um, in particular, there were too many poorly managed reshuffles. And I think it was a problem. I, and I think. Either you should do reshuffles properly, or you should, which is what the present prime minister does. You shouldn't do them very often. Um, uh, I did. Um, I did want to say to Tony after one of the reshuffles, "Are you sure you got that right?" And he said, "Well, which yeah, one?" It was, definitely, he said, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I, it was 2005 um, after the election. So, I, so I said to him, um, "You should have remembered Clement Attlee's two phrases. There's only two phrases you need for a reshuffle. One is." not up to the job, and the other is you've had a good innings. What else do you need? <laughs> Attlee did it beautifully, and I think, I, I think Blair, I, I read Alistair Campbell's diary, which is obviously mm. very engaging. And the way he talks about reshuffles, it's so amateur, it drives me crazy. Do you think it's easier if ministers stay longer? Yes, it w it, yes. And, and, and actually the ministers, the the, 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 yeah, obviously, so, see, I mean, reshuffles are important. They're a very important part of exercise of prime minister power, but they kind of lose value if you over overuse it. You know, um, but the other thing is, at Minister of State level, there are a lot of people being shuffled around all the time. So where you had a great Secretary of State like Alan Milburn and a great um, uh, Minister of State like John Hutton, fantastic. And John was there and they, were, they got on well and, and Alan built the team and it was marvellous. But where those, the engine room people were being moved, even if the Secretary of State stayed, sometimes it made it really hard. Um. If you remember uh, from Margaret Thatcher's uh, televised uh, autobiography, she said, um, uh, one got the reputation as being a good butcher. I don't know about that, but I did learn to carve the joint. <laughs> <laughs> she had no problem. Please, down the front here. Hi, uh, Marie Kemple, former student of QML. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering what the role is, or if there is a role, for kind of communicating what you're doing to the public. Because when I interviewed one of your colleagues from the delivery unit a couple of years ago, William Jordan, he said that was one of the things he would have thought you would do better if you did it again. But just kind of picking up on your earlier point about, you know, increasing the number of fines you were collecting, actually, does the public want to know that, or do they just think, oh, you should be doing all this anyway? Yeah. Well, they do, they, they do think that about fine collection. The, um, but the, I, I actually... I have a different view from William, and, the, uh, and I, I was really keen not to be too much in the public eye, because I, I, I wanted, like, if, if we had a delivery success, I wanted the relevant minister to get the credit, because that's what politics is about. And if, I thought if, if we had a success and I got the credit, that would actually damage my relationships with the department, and I needed to have a trusting conversation with the civil servants where they could tell me and our team stuff that was difficult, and not to think, well, that's going to get out there. <coughs> Um, and so, so I, I didn't want to be in the public eye. After all, Downing Street had a pretty phenomenal communications machine. <laughs> why, why would we try and replicate it? Um, you know, it was never going to be that good, um, even if we tried it. Plus, 
once you get, if you've got a part of government and you spend a lot of time on the phone to journalists or you're dealing with the communications, you get driven out of the routines and into the crisis management. So I really didn't want to do that. I never, ever spoke to a journalist without the press office asking me to do it. I never sort of volunteered it. I used to do those weird and wonderful press conferences once a year where we did that. But, but basically, I, did, I didn't want the public eye. And, and if ever we were in the media, it was nearly always a leak of some, not, not from our team, but our report had gone out. And it was never fun. Charlotte Rose, BBC Parliament. Um, there was a debate in the House of Lords a couple of weeks ago um, about civil service reform, and a lot of former civil servants expressed extreme concern about increasing politicisation within the civil <coughs> service. From your point of view, how do you think that would affect delivery if civil servants were to be less politically neutral? It's a, it's a very, very, it's a, like, I'm, 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 um, I wouldn't want the, personally, I wouldn't want the civil service to be more political. I, I, I um, you know, I've looked at models like, like in, uh, often a new minister in Australia appoints a permanent secretary and, and has that power. You, so you could look at tweaks on it, but I, I wouldn't want anything remotely like an American system where you appoint the whole lot of things. I, I find that, um, well, first of all, it's not very British, but also I don't think it would work. I don't, and I don't think it does work very well in um, in Washington, to be honest. So I, I, I wouldn't like that. So I, I don't think, I don't think the answer. If, if you're a frustrated government, and after all, most governments are frustrated at some time or other with the civil service. I think leaping for the idea if only they were more politically like us is not probably the solution. If the problem is delivery, if you if you thought there were lots of people politically subverting you. That would be a different issue. I don't think that is the issue. So my instinct is not to go down that route. Any other questions? No? There we are. We bring it to a close. Uh, just in the, we're over time, failure of delivery on my part. I, <laughs> <laughs> I apologise. Um, so there's three I things. Uh, that, that, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. This was a fact finding mission, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, so, first of all, the, the next mile end group will take place on the 27th of February when uh, the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee member David Miles will talk about uncertainty and the transition to a new normal for monetary policy. I guess that's about rise in interest rates. Right? <laughs> uh, secondly, uh, do join us for a drink outside in the reception. And thirdly, please join me in congratulating Michael Barber. Wonderful stuff. Wonderful stuff. Tour de force.